Okay, we have come to the third part of this lecture six. Uh, so we are really on to general relativity. Uh, actually, we start chapter four, the, really the first section, and uh, seeking a relative theory of gravitation. Uh, before we do that, we could review the Newtonian theory. So in what sense, uh, we'll see how we can obtain the relative theory from Newtonian theory. <laughs> Uh, Newtonian gravity, we have says that if you have a force, you have a source mass, big M, uh, acting on a test mass, uh, lowercase m, and that they are separated by the distance r, then the force between them is along the vector uh, between the two mass points, and thus you have this uh, familiar expression for Newtonian gravitational force. Uh, just like electrostatics, we can define the electric field in, as the electric field as the electric force per unit test charge. We can define a gravitational field as the uh, f gravitational force per unit mass. So the G is the gravitational field. So in terms of this gravitational field G, the Newton theory writes as minus G, just basically uh, get rid of the small m. Uh, m over r square in the direction of the radial direction. Now you remember this is for a point source mass, okay? And uh, in this case, we actually locate the uh, the source at the origin of the coordinate system. Now, just like Coulomb's law can be written as Gauss's law, so we can write the Gauss law for the uh, Newtonian theory, which will be the, uh, a surface integral over some surface S of the gravitational field dot into an element of surface, uh, element of area, and equal to uh, minus 4 pi G M. M is, now in this case, it can be arbitrary mass distribution as long as it's enclosed inside the surface S. Okay. <clears throat> so if we have an arbitrary mass distribution, it has some field G, and if you take a surface, then if you, uh, it, dot the g into a surface element, add them all up, that's always equal to the total mass inside with this coefficient. Now we can convert <coughs> both sides of this uh, expression in terms of some volume integral. In particular, on the left-hand side, the surface integral can be written as a volume integral by the diversion theorem. In which the diversion theorem says the divergence of g <coughs> Uh, integral over the volume equal to the surface integral of g dot to dA, which is the left hand side of this equation. And uh, on the right hand side, the total mass m, of course, can be written as in terms of mass density, rho, so rho dv integrated over the volume will give you the total mass m. So therefore, this Gauss law can be written as, as <coughs> volume integral on both sides. Uh, the integrand on the left hand side is divergence of g, on the right hand side is the proportion to the mass density. Now, <coughs> so so there's uh, a Gauss law in terms of, in some integral form. In the case, both written as volume integrals. But since vol the volume is arbitrary, we can take any, uh, so therefore, this equality must hold for integrand. <coughs> so therefore, we have the differential form of the Gauss's law says divergence of g is equal to proportional to the mass density with this coefficient related to the Newton's constant. Now, actually, we'll prefer to write this in terms of uh, gravitational potential, which is defined to be the, the g is equal to minus the gradient of the potential phi. And uh, in case you uh, you say, oh, I don't remember what potential is, uh, remember the familiar case, if you have a spherical symmetric uh, mass m, then its gravitational potential is simply g m over r. So this, hopefully you have seen this before. <coughs> Now, so therefore, Newton's field equation, which is Gauss's law, is simply written into potential, is saying that the, the plus of the gravity potential is equal to minus four pi g over rho. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, 
uh, d phi should be equal to minus 4 pi g over rho g times rho. Now here's a field equation. Remember, field theory has two parts. One is the field equation, other part is the equation of motion. Equation of motion equals force. Remember, it's definitely equal to m times acceleration. And now force is always, always act as a middleman relates this to acceleration to the force law. In this case, it's just mass times the gravitational uh, field. Now, both sides have m, so you cross out the m, so you have acceleration equal to g. And g equal to minus the gradient, so therefore the acceleration equal to minus the gradient of the gravitational potential. So that's the equation of motion in Newton theory. Now you notice this equation of motion has a very peculiar feature. It's totally independent of the any property of the test particles. It's, it's, it's mass, charge, any of these things doesn't appear in this equation. Okay. And this will give a clue to the, how to write the relative theory. But the point, of course, Newton theory is not compatible with special relativity. First of all, the space and time coordinates are treated not on equal footing. You know, in fact, there's no time dependence here. Okay, so only have uh, complicated, uh, maybe complicated space dependence, but there's no time dependence. And then in fact, it's a static theory. Okay. It's like Coulomb's uh, static uh, electrostatics, and the effect and motion are not included. And also, remember, we're talking about action of distance force, which implies an infinite speed signal transmission, which is incompatible with Raul told us saying that the fastest you can transmit it is the speed of light. So therefore, we seek a relative theory of gravitation, which really means how to generalize this field equation and equation motion to be compatible with relativity. So that's our task. Okay. Now, <coughs> the, the relative theory, of course, is general relativity of Einstein, which has really a unique history. Because remember, most physics discovery were made when there's a crisis and we need to uh, then force us to discover new effects. But GI effects are tiny in our cosmic neighborhood. Remember we said this. Is, so we cannot, uh, by looking at the, any phenomena, say, oh, that's not compatible with Newton theory. We need to find a new theory. So it's the, and the discovery of GI is entirely prompted by, the, uh, by the, the, so the pure thought of Albert Einstein. Okay. So therefore, we need to know what's his motivation since he was not there was a crisis he to solve. Why he wanted to find the uh, <coughs> the GR? So we need to talk about Einstein's motivation for GR. <coughs> there are three related uh, interrelated considerations. I will list them. <coughs> First of all, as we said, we need to seek a relative theory of gravitation. A Newtonian theory is not compatible with special relativity. And furthermore, the inertia frame of reference, which are fundamental to special relativity loses the privilege of status in present gravity, which it will exp In fact, in some sense, uh, uh, there are the, 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 the whole notion of inertia frame of reference will be generalized in the presence of gravity. And also, Einstein, the way Einstein put it, his second motivation, the space is not a thing. By this means, Einstein's conviction that physics law should be should not depend on reference frame, which just expresses the relationship among physical processes in the world, but that do not have independent the, the, the reference frame do not have independent existence. So you cannot it itself cannot be a cause of anything. Okay. <clears throat> and remember to say the physics laws is same in all inertia frame in, in all coordinate frame is a symmetry, and in fact using the symmetry principle, Einstein was able to find out the GI equations, the, <coughs> the field equations and the equation of motion. Okay. So that's what, uh, that's why we, of course, we talked about how symmetry is related to uh, uh, equation must be written in tensors and so on. <coughs> and also, which you will explain, there is something called inertia mass and gravitational mass, and we usually set them equal equal. And this in terms of the is an experimental fact. And uh, Einstein say, we want to understand why, what's, why does this 
this should be equal. What is the meaning? And he generalized this in something called equivalent principle, which is trying to be a handle for him to go from special relativity to general relativity. And which I see, the GR theory encompasses Newton theory, saying with only certain limits, uh, Newton theory is valid. <coughs> and the GR is geometric theory, extend gravity field that's strong and can be time dependent. Okay, let's talk about some takeaway from this lecture number six. Uh, we first talked about space-time diagram. In particular, we talked about space-like, time-like, light-like regions. And uh, it's, uh, it helps to understand causal effects in, the, uh, in, in, in physics. The, in particular, a word line contained, must be contained in a light cone, so, and so therefore it would be ever-increasing time. And Lorentz transformation in the space diagram means that the, the time and space axis must close in or, or, uh, or, or fan out with the equal angle. And, uh, and also, relativity event order does not violate causality. The geometric formulation of uh, special relativity is summarized. In particular, we say that really all the non true effect contained in this metric, which is uh, minus one, 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 is diagonal. Okay. It contains basically all the special relativity effect. And the Newtonian gravity, the few equations written as this way, and equation motion is, is this way. So we are seeking generalization of these equations to so that to be compatible with relativity. <sighs> The lecture number seven, next time, we will basically start general author, but in a way I believe is, is historically is, is, is the way it started and also is much more physical rather than just more mathematical, which is called, using so-called equivalent principle, which is equivalent between gravity and acceleration. And there's something called a weak equivalent principle, which bases inertia mass and the gravitational mass are equal. Then it's generalized to bias and to strong equivalent principle to electricity magnetism, and then we will see that gravitational will have some effect called gravitational redshift, means the wavelength of light climbing out of gravitational potential will be stretched, so it will be redshifted. <coughs> and a gravitational time dilation effect, a clock will run faster when located in a high gravitational potential point. All these uh, effects are contained in general, but it's much easier to see them in this equivalent principle approach. Okay, that's end of lecture number six.